uh, thanks everyone for attending. Um, today I hope to um, just go through the top 10 reptile consultations that we tend to see in practice. I think uh, many of you will have had um, reptiles coming in and out of your, your clinic and I just want to try and go through some tips for appropriate diagnostics and um, just kind of eliminating um, certain diagnostics off your differential list um, with some useful tips, practical tips to tell very similar conditions apart um, and also give obviously some useful information about treatment and prevention of these diseases. I think it's really important uh, with reptile medicine that if you're going to get a good caseload and you're going to kind of develop confidence and trust with the, your reptile clients, you'll need to know a lot about uh, reptile husbandry, reptile biology and also giving them advice on nutrition and, and ways to prevent certain diseases. I think the vast majority of cases that I see in clinic uh, with reptiles that are ill would relate to husbandry, how they're kept and um, nutrition as well. So we'll go through a few um, kind of handy hints and tips and uh, hopefully equip you with some, some knowledge to, to impress your reptile clients. So if we're going to go through the top 10 common problems, uh, many of you will already know the top five I think and um, maybe we'd be able to guess if we had a, a live audience feedback but just going through the top ten that I, I think I would see on a regular basis. Metabolic bone disease is a big topic. It's getting better these days because of lighting and, and advances in husbandry equipment that we see and also nutritional supplements and knowledge. Infections is a, a wide area that we'll cover uh, one or two of the, the most commonly seen um, infection types in reptiles. Reproductive issues are very, very common, quite seasonal, um, not this time of year perhaps, but I definitely see a lot of re reptile egg binding and reproductive cases throughout the spring right through into um, autumn. Um, impactions, uh, so substrate impactions and prolapses would also be fairly common. So those first five we'll try and go through in some detail. We're fairly limited on time, so we'll hopefully just skim over the, the last five, which would be parasites, burns, stomatitis, uh, dissectitis or difficulty shedding skin and fractures. So if we start with metabolic bone disease, a lot of you will be very familiar with this. I think a lot of reptiles in the past suffered from metabolic bone disease to a very severe extent. But it's important to note that metabolic bone disease is a range of, of uh, clinical signs or, or disease processes going on right from the water dragon on the left hand side of the screen which has come in really in a state of neglect and emaciation. It's got a fracture of its uh, one of its forelimbs. It's completely emaciated, probably hasn't eaten in weeks, totally dehydrated and almost on death's door. Um, and if we took an x-ray of that lizard, we would see you know, severe uh, softening of the skeleton and absorption of the skeleton. Very, very poor bone density, which has resulted in the fracture that the, the lizard appeared at the clinic for. And then metabolic bone disease can be subclinical as well. It's important to, to question your reptile clients about their husbandry, about their lighting, about their nutrition of their animals and learn to recognize the warning signs that would suggest that perhaps we could be dealing with a subclinical hypocalcemia, hypocalcemia or a subclinical metabolic bone disease where, where calcium reserves are already starting to be absorbed from the skeleton. So that leopard gecko on the right of the screen looks to all intents and purposes quite normal. It's moving around normally but it presented to me with anorexia for several weeks duration and it was um, fairly low in calcium and it was to do with uh, poor diet. So um, if we're talking about what is metabolic bone disease, a lot of you already know but essentially it's poor bone calcification or um, absorption of the calcium reserves within, within the skeletal system. It comes from um, two things really, a vitamin D3 deficiency uh, and a calcium deficiency or both things going on together. They're intrinsically linked, vitamin D metabolism and calcium as, as you all know. So one of the ways we can have a vitamin D3 deficiency would be providing inadequate UVB light to reptiles. Reptiles are fairly um, unique in that you know most of them come from fairly warm climates, even if they don't, they're relying on solar energy really for a lot of their metabolic processes and, and to raise their body temperature being cold-blooded or ectothermic. So temperature is really important but also sunlight is very, very important and if we're going to keep these animals in captivity successfully, we want to mimic the natural conditions and the wild um, conditions and environment that they would occupy in the wild. One of the ways we have to do that, more importantly in certain species than other species, is to provide artificial UV light, 
basically replicate the sun's rays and UV light is required for vitamin D3 synthesis in the skin. Without that, they can't absorb calcium from their diet. The other way they could get metabolic bone disease is providing the correct lighting but not giving enough calcium in the diet or having an inappropriate calcium phosphorus balance um, within the diet. And also some other vitamin, vitamins and minerals um, come into calcium metabolism, particularly vitamin A, which is another big problem um, in reptile captive reptile nutrition and we'll see a few problems down the line in the in the webinar tonight with vitamin A deficiency as well. So really nutrition and lighting are the mainstays of, of preventing metabolic bone disease in captive reptiles. As I say, vitamin D is produced by the ultraviolet light on skin. In the wild they would be getting high exposures and that's difficult to reproduce in the captive environment. Luckily in recent years, you know, the, the equipment available and the lighting available to Reptile Keepers has really come on in leaps and bounds and there's a lot of research being done. When I was keeping reptiles as, as a young teenager um, and before, you know, lighting was pretty primitive and metabolic bone disease was a far more common issue for reptiles presenting to the vet clinic, perhaps like the only, the only condition uh, at times for reptiles presenting. Um, dietary balance and supplements and things like that have come on again in leaps and bounds uh, in recent years. So generally the, the reptile owning public are very, very knowledgeable on these issues for the most part, um, the ones that you know have kept reptiles for some time. The issues I tend to see where metabolic bone disease crops up or the cases where it crops up would be keepers who are very new to the reptile hobby and it's maybe their first lizard or their first tortoise or, or first reptile pet and they really don't know a lot of the ins and outs of calcium metabolism and the importance of UV light and that's where we come in you know, in, as, in, as educators really in terms of explaining these processes and why they're so important and why the correct equipment is so important. So going to clinical signs of metabolic bone disease, they can, they can range from very, very subtle to very, very severe. Anorexia is, is one of the most common early signs as well as weight loss um, associated with that. In the early stages of hypocalcemia where the, the circulating, circulating level of calcium in the blood is dropping, we tend to see uh, weakness. Um, or muscle tremors and, and fasciculations in the limbs, sometimes around the head, um, little wobbles and, and tremors. Um, weakness is uh, a very common sign where animals like this gecko on the, on the table won't be able to lift its body off the ground, so you often have a, a kind of a shuffling gait or a crawling gait rather than walking around up on their feet and supporting their full body weight. Um, lameness might come from you know, um, osteomyelation and, and softening of the bones, but also might come from fractures. So you may have a, a, a broken bone or an animal with a, a deformed limb coming in and you realize it's a, a secondary fracture or a physiological fracture related to, um, you know, bone softening. Reproductive conditions as well can be caused by or exacerbated by metabolic bone disease. So egg binding or dystopia and also pre-ovulatory egg binding or pre-ovulatory follicular stasis can often result from low calcium and obviously reproductive females have a high calcium demand. A lot of these reptile species are giving birth uh, to live young which they require skeletal development obviously to mature those, those fetuses or else they're, they're laying of a large clutch of calcified shelled eggs. So the calcium demands in a reproductive female are very very high and if the diet or the lighting isn't appropriate and correct at that time when the, the animal is coming towards breeding, then it can send the animal into metabolic bone disease very quickly in the later stages of gestation. Fractures, as I said, um, can be common. Um, pathological fractures or just trauma that would normally be fine, it could cause a fracture. Scoliosis of the, the spine and especially of the tail um, can suggest a historical metabolic bone disease problem um, if it's been long-term kind of chronic metabolic bone disease. In Chelonians uh, or tortoises and turtles you often see a soft shell to varying degrees and in uh, lizards especially we see a sign called rubber jaw which is just softening of the mandible and you can get folding fractures of the mandible or if, you, if you're examining the animal and press on, on the mandible it will actually bend, it's that soft. You can see that gecko's mouth sort of hanging open a little bit, that's abnormal and a, a classic sign of metabolic bone disease. This chameleon, you know, you can see the scoliosis in his spine and also this is a veiled chameleon or Yemen chameleon male which should have a very upright impressive crest on his head and that crest is completely skewed off to, to one side um, and he's having much, much difficulty gripping, he's very weak grip and he's, he's kind of 
shuffling along on his belly, um, just through chronic.